Ladies and gentlemen, here we go to the professor at the Imperial College in London. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Bronstein. Thank you very much. So I hope that that, that uh, somebody got five points to Gryffindor. So uh, I would like to talk today about uh, deep learning on graphs. And by saying graphs, I mean uh, networks. Basically, that's the mathematical term for, for networks. And um, I will discuss some of the foundations of these problems, uh, recent successes, future challenges, and overall next steps. So allow me to start with actually a little bit taking a step back and from a little bit far away, uh, the concept of inductive bias. Uh, this is a, a fundamental concept in, in learning. It refers to the set of assumptions that the machine learning system has to make about the problem in order to uh, apply it to previously uh, not seen um, input. And if we take a very simple machine learning system, actually some of the earliest uh, neural networks called multi-layer perceptrons, we know that they can approximate uh, any continuous function to any desired accuracy. So this is a property called universal approximation that was proven uh, in the end of the 80s for, for these neural networks. So it sounds like a good piece of news, right? Because basically we can approximate, we can, we can represent anything we want with these neural networks. But the moment you come to apply these, uh, these models to real data, such as images, uh, we get into a problem. Because if you look at these images, let's say the problem is to classify digits, to say that this is digit three. Even if I move it by one pixel to the right, as shown here, basically the representation of the uh, image that is passed into a neural network is just a vector. And you see that it looks completely different. So as a result, the neural network will need to see a lot of data to be able to tell that all these instances are the same digits, so to learn invariance from the data. And because of the curse of dimensionality, uh, we don't really have uh, anything close in the universe uh, to that amount of data that is needed. So the right inductive bias uh, was really the crucial thing that made deep learning work, in particular in computer vision problems, where it really uh, uh, provided stellar performance. And these are the classical convolutional neural networks where the inductive bias came in the form of what is called translation equivariance or shared local weights. So the idea that you can uh, recycle the same weights and apply them at different positions in the image uh, was one of the uh, keys to success of uh, these uh, architectures in computer vision and image analysis problems. Now, let me show you a different problem. So what you see here is a molecule. So if you're interested, this is a molecule of caffeine, which many others are very familiar with. So this is a graph, right? So the nodes here represent atoms. The edges represent uh, chemical bonds. And let's say that we want to predict some chemical property of this uh, molecule. Let's say what uh, uh, physicists or chemists call the atomization energy, the energy that takes to break it apart. Now, how do we represent this molecule? We can just take the properties, the features of the nodes, and put them into a vector. But the problem here is that we have many more ways than before to, to do it. Actually, any permutation of the nodes uh, will result in a valid vector. And uh, this is really a big problem. And we see that molecules are just one example of such graph structured data. We see graphs everywhere. Probably the most prominent example are social networks, where uh, the nodes are uh, users and the edges are social relations or interactions between them. But we also encounter graphs or networks in biological sciences, where we look at interactions between different biomolecules, such as proteins in computer graphics and computer vision, where we use graphs to represent three-dimensional objects, such as meshes, and many, many more applications. So the deep learning on graphs is essentially about finding the right inductive biases for these problems. Sometimes uh, these are called relational inductive biases, and uh, there are multiple terms that are used synonymously in this field. Geometric deep learning is one of them. It's uh, because of a paper that we wrote a few years ago where we popularized this term. But you will also find terms such as graph representation learning or uh, relational inductive biases. And graph neural networks are an implementation of uh, such inductive biases. So the history of uh, graph representation learning is actually uh, 
quite uh, long, and we can uh, trace back some of the first papers to the uh, mid 90s. But I would say it is probably correct to say that, that most of the recent works are from the past, uh, or most of the interesting or the, the, the critical mass of the works are from the past couple of years. And uh, in the past years, uh, graph neural networks have really become one of the hottest topics in machine learning. So if you look at the statistics of iClear, which is one of the, the main conferences in this field, you see that this is really one of the, the prominent keywords. Now, what makes graph neural networks so interesting and so similar, but at the same time different from the traditional uh, uh, deep learning architectures? So let's look at uh, classical CNNs. So the input in this case is a grid. So the image is a function defined on a grid. And if we want to do uh, operations on the grid, like convolutions, basically I need to look at each pixel and its neighbors. And what convolutional neural networks do? They aggregate the uh, features or the, the values in the pixels of, of the neighbors by just simply multiplying them by some weights. Now I can do the same thing in a graph, right? So the neighbors will be the nodes that are attached by edges to some node. So, so far it looks exactly the same thing. But one thing to know that in a grid, when I move to a different position, I have a constant number of neighbors. On a graph, I might have a very different number of neighbors. So if you think of social networks, some nodes are extremely popular. They might have millions of, of neighbors, some just a few, right? So the degree of the node might be very different. Another thing to note is that in, in a grid, I have a fixed ordering of the neighbors. I can always talk about a node to the left or a node to the right. And this allows me actually to apply the same weights to uh, the same order of the nodes. So I can really share the weights. In case of graphs, the ordering of the nodes can be completely arbitrary. So I don't have an ordering of the nodes, or at least not a canonical one. And this actually uh, makes uh, graph neural networks quite different. And if you think of uh, a blueprint for how to do uh, convolution-like operations on graphs, uh, we only have two types of operations. We can aggregate information from our neighbors, and uh, we can process it in some way and then update the node itself. So these are the two operations, uh, aggregate and update. So aggregate takes uh, the most general form uh, of a function that is applied to uh, features of the node and the neighbor. And uh, importantly, the function is permutation invariant, again, because I don't have uh, a canonical ordering of the neighbors. There are some particular examples, uh, important architectures that can be applied. For example, if we do linear aggregation of the neighbors, you can think of it as a node-wise transformation of the node features by some linear operation and a linear diffusion, basically somehow mixing the, 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 the node features on the graph. And these are popular architectures such as GCN or graph convolutional networks. We can also do something a little bit more complex. So we can do still a linear aggregation of the, of the node features, but the weights now will depend on the feature. So this is, for example, how graph attention networks work. And in general, it can be some nonlinear aggregation in the form of this function h that appears on this slide. Now, let's look more into details of what is similar and what is different in uh, graph neural networks if we compare them to traditional deep learning pipelines. And one thing to notice is that if we look at the historical development of, let's say, convolutional neural networks, actually the early models such as AlexNet were relatively shallow. In AlexNet, we had eight layers and relatively large filters. So 11 by 11, which is considered large filter. But uh, as these methods became more elaborate, actually a few years afterwards, uh, networks became deeper and with smaller filters, as small as three by three pixels. And there are several reasons. First of all, obviously, smaller filters are much more computationally efficient. And second is that it, it appears that in convolutional neural networks, you can uh, construct complex features from simple ones, uh, a property that is called compositionality. So uh, the, few, the first few layers will, uh, will construct simple geometric primitives, such as edges, corners. And then as you go deeper into the convolutional network, you will see more complex structures, such as uh, parts of the face, for example, eyes, uh, nose, and so on emerge. Now, this appears to be not the case in graph neural networks. And this wishful thinking that we can uh, compose complex structures from simple ones uh, doesn't always work. 
So for example, it was shown uh, recently that graph neural networks, at least the message passing type of graph neural network that I showed before are equivalent to what is called the Weisferrer-Lehmann graph isomorphism test, which is a classical uh, graph coloring uh, uh, algorithm that is uh, used in graph theory. And for example, it is known that uh, the Weisferrer-Lehmann test cannot count triangles in graphs. So uh, this is this tells you that even such a simple structure cannot be constructed from uh, from primitive ones. Another thing that you notice that unlike the Euclidean, the traditional case, it is actually difficult to train deep graph neural networks. And this is a typical result. So this is actually a very recent paper that appeared uh, in iClear uh, this year. Uh, so it requires quite heavy machinery, uh, special uh, regularization to train a deep uh, graph neural network. But if you look at actually at the results that you obtain with the deeper network, you see that they're inferior to the results that you would obtain with a network with just a couple of layers. And there are several reasons to it. One of them is what is called uh, feature smoothing. It means that features on the uh, nodes uh, tend to, to collapse to a single point. But probably more fundamental phenomenon that again was described in a very recent paper is uh, what is called uh, information bottleneck. And it has to do with the fact that uh, in some types of graphs, the number of neighbors as you go to, uh, to bigger and bigger neighborhoods uh, tends to grow exponentially. So an example of graphs where it happens are small world uh, graphs. And if you have this exponential growth of neighbors and you also need long range uh, in dependencies, then you run into a, a bottleneck, meaning that you have a lot of data that you need to squeeze into a single uh, node vector. And uh, as a result, message passing neural networks are inefficient in propagating information from distant nodes when uh, the graph structure is like this. And in some cases, it might not matter. In some other cases, like molecular graphs, for example, uh, uh, long distance uh, uh, relations are really important. So that's why uh, uh, depth is rather problematic. Now, in a work that I did with uh, colleagues at Peter, we tried to take this idea to the extreme. Basically, we wanted to see uh, what can we do with really very shallow uh, uh, graph neural networks where we have just one con graph convolutional layer, but we allow for uh, multi-hop diffusion operators. So a uh, rough analogy in classical CNN would be just one convolution, but with big filters. And the nice thing here that if we use linear uh, diffusion, linear filters, we can actually pre-compute the diffused features. And then it boils down to just multi-layer perceptron, which is applied to, to these pre-diffused features. And as a result, the neural network is extremely efficient. It can scale to extremely large graphs, such as those that we see at Twitter or at Facebook with uh, hundreds of millions of nodes. And apparently, such simple architecture uh, is very efficient. So if you compare them to, to state-of-the-art models, it is on par, or in some cases, actually performs better. But it's significantly faster, by more than an order of magnitude in uh, training and in inference. So we call this sign standing for scalable inception-like graph neural networks because it reminds the classical Google inception modules that were applied about five years ago for obtaining state-of-the-art in image classification uh, with convolutional neural networks. Another thing that I mentioned, basically, if we already want to, uh, to enrich our filters, uh, and I mentioned that, that we cannot count structures, what we can do, we can actually help the graph neural network uh, to count substructures by just providing it as uh, some pre-computed feature vector, so a kind of structural node encoding. So we can uh, pre-count some uh, predefined uh, structures of size k. These could be, for example, triangles or clicks or cycles of, or paths of different, uh, different length. And we provide this as a node descriptor. And then we do standard message passing. So in this case, the pre-computation might be expensive. In the worst case, it costs us n to the power of k. And here is the number of nodes, and k is the size of the substructure. But the message passing itself is linear and local. And uh, what we gain by uh, in this way is that we are strictly more powerful than the message passing neural networks that are equivalent to vice file lemon uh, graph isomorphism test. And uh, another way of looking at it, you basically have here a problem-specific inductive bias. Because in some settings, in some uh, types of problems, in some data sets, you know a priori what structures, uh, what graphs of structures are important. 
So in social networks, for example, clicks or triangles uh, tend to be important. They have certain sociological interpretation, if you want. In, uh, for example, chemical data sets, uh, cycles are important. So you see that if we introduce these uh, inductive biases, we get, uh, in some settings, uh, state-of-the-art performance. And the results are especially striking on chemical data sets. So here we are predicting chemical properties of molecular graphs. And if we uh, count cycles of certain size, in this case of size 6, these are very prominent features. They are called aromatic rings. So if you look at, again at the molecule of caffeine, you see that these uh, cycles uh, appear actually with a cycle of size 6 and a cycle of size 5. And these are really abundant features in organic molecules. So if we introduce this inductive bias, we see a significant jump in performance of uh, such graph neural networks. So let me briefly go through what I believe to be the uh, next steps uh, in this field of uh, graph neural networks. And uh, one thing that really made a breakthrough in traditional deep learning is this combination or confluence of uh, three pillars, uh, data, compute, and software. So in the uh, case of computer vision, let's say con convolutional neural networks, the data was a large scale collections of images, uh, multiple millions of annotated images. The compute was uh, GPUs, basically used for general purpose computing. And it seems that GPUs are uh, very well tailored for convolutional neural networks because they, are, uh, they support very efficiently this type of single instruction, multiple data uh, operations. And software was really uh, open uh, source uh, software packages that democratized uh, deep learning. Software packages such as uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow. So if we look at the situation in graph learning, we don't really have standardized benchmarks, both the data sets and the tasks that will be similar to ImageNet. That was the classical benchmark in computer vision on which uh, the breakthrough happened uh, in about eight years ago. Uh, so the closest that we, we, we have to it is uh, Open Graph Benchmark that was launched actually less than a year ago. And it's a collection of data sets and, uh, and tasks. Uh, and actually, graphs are uh, graph-related problems are much more varied compared to computer vision problems. And uh, Open Benchmark, uh, uh, Open Graph Benchmark in particular supports three major types of problems. These are graph classification, node classification, and link prediction. So this is a large-scale benchmark, and it's uh, uh, always growing. So I, I hope that uh, in the next few years it will become uh, really the de facto standard for uh, developing and testing graph uh, learning algorithms. The second pillar is software libraries. And here again, the situation is uh, much more optimistic than it used to be a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, if you were to implement uh, the latest and greatest graph deep neural network architecture, you had to rely on some buggy and unmaintainable code uh, from the authors of the paper. In, in the best case, nowadays, you, uh, you, you, you have uh, professionally maintained libraries such as DGL uh, that is uh, supported by Amazon or PyTorch geometric, which are widely used in the research community. Second aspect is efficiency and scalability. And um, one of the uh, issues that precludes, or has so far precluded, the, uh, uh, the application of graph neural networks in industrial settings is the size of the graphs that we need to deal with. So if you look at problems at Twitter or Facebook, uh, sometimes the graphs have hundreds of billions or so or millions or sometimes even billions of nodes and tens of billions of edges. And uh, many of the uh, graph neural network architectures that are described in the scientific literature are simply uh, a no-go for these settings. So it is relatively recently that the community started looking at uh, these problems. And uh, there are already several algorithms that try to look at uh, how to scale uh, graph neural networks. And one of the issues, for example, is that when you want to apply uh, stochastic optimization techniques that are uh, often, or I would say in most cases, are used for, for training uh, deep neural networks, is the assumption of statistical independence between the samples. Uh, 
uh, is uh, usually not correct for graphs because if you take uh, graph nodes, they are related by ages, so there are statistical dependencies. So there are many fundamental questions of uh, how to train uh, efficiently large-scale graph neural networks. Another important question is that graphs that appear in many applications are actually not static, they are dynamic. So if you look at Twitter, uh, Twitter is evolving all the time. So new users join the network, uh, some users are leaving the network, uh, people uh, tweet something, they, they retweet, reply, they like. Uh, so it's a network that is uh, always uh, living and always evolving. So the right way of thinking of it is actually as a, a continuous time dynamic graph. So you can think of it as a stream of asynchronous events such as a node or edge uh, insertion or deletion. And there are very few architectures that support these cases. So at Twitter with uh, uh, colleagues uh, Emanuele Rossi and, and others, we have developed an architecture that we call temporal graph networks which uh, addresses these cases. So this is generalization of message passing neural networks for settings where uh, actually everything is time stamped. So we have a, this uh, asynchronous stream of uh, graph events that form uh, the graph in time. And uh, basically, in this case, the, 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 the special part of the architecture is the encoder. You can train it in an unsupervised way, basically to predict uh, the edges in the future or some points of time. And then the decoder can be uh, task specific. So you create node representation. And then, for example, you can use it for different tasks, such as uh, classifying the nodes, predicting, for example, if the user is doing something wrong, predicting edges. So you can predict engagements. Uh, and this is uh, basically bread and butter for recommender systems. Another thing uh, that is important, I already mentioned it briefly, is the use of high order structures. So, uh, so far, graph neural networks have really been about uh, nodes and edges. And we know that in many complex networks, especially biological networks or social networks, we, uh, we have uh, complex high order structures, such as triangles and maybe more complex uh, graph, graph, red, uh, graph reds and graph motifs. So uh, one maybe a simple and to some extent naive way would be to use them by just counting them. But you can think of maybe more complex uh, message passing architectures where the aggregation uh, happens at these uh, higher order or higher dimensional structures. So you can think of uh, topological constructions such as uh, simplicial complexes. And this has been largely unexplored or unknown in this field of uh, uh, deep learning on graphs. Another important topic is actually the very assumption that we are given an input graph in many cases is incorrect. So this is a typical situation for biological problems where we have, let's say, interactions between molecules such as proteins. So uh, this graph, we have about 20,000 proteins in, in our human body. We don't really know how they interact with each other. So some proteins are considered important, so they're probably researched to death and we know how they interact, but some others are maybe less prominent, so we don't know uh, many of the edges in this graph. So this graph is given only uh, maybe partially or maybe it is noisy. Uh, uh, so the bottom line that, that in the best case, we have maybe just an approximate version of the graph. So it is possible to design uh, graph neural networks that build the graph uh, as part of the learning process. And uh, together with my collaborators from MIT, we actually did some of the first works in this domain. We call these dynamic graph CNNs where the graph is constructed on the fly using, let's say, k-nearest neighbors. And uh, it can also be updated between layers because the graph is really task dependent. So depending on the downstream task, you can build the best graph that, that suits your task. And uh, this really brings to this important question is whether the computational graph that is used for message passing in graph neural networks has to be the same as the input graph if it is provided at all. And in many cases, we see that it doesn't need to be the case. So we really want to separate or decouple these, uh, uh, these two constructions. So in dynamic graph CNNs, the graph is actually constructed to represent some local structure, geometric structure of, uh, of the, the input, which is a, a point cloud. We applied uh, these methods first to, to problems in computer vision and graphics, where we were dealing with 3D, 3D point clouds. But you can really apply it to any kind of data. 
So in recent work with collaborators from Munich, we applied it to, to healthcare electronic records where we have uh, data on patients and the data can come in the form of phenotype features such as age, sex and so on. And also maybe imaging features that you can get from uh, basically from medical devices. So we want to build the graph that represents some kind of relations or similarity of the patients, but we don't know a priori how to build it. So we learn it for the given task. And we see that uh, using this construction, we can significantly improve uh, uh, the performance of uh, important problems such as disease classification. We can predict, for example, whether a patient has Alzheimer's based on the brain imaging features. Now, I should say that in retrospective, uh, these kind of methods uh, are related to what was called manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which was a popular class of uh, machine learning algorithms about 20 years ago, which uh, looked at high dimensional data with the premise that the data might live in a very high dimensional space, but it actually, uh, it has low uh, uh, intrinsic dimension. And the convenient metaphor for it is that the data comes from low dimensional manifold. So the, the, the usual metaphor, uh, a way of visualizing it in few dimensions is this Swiss roll surface. So the, the, the typical way that these algorithms worked were to start with first building a representation of this uh, low dimensional structure, usually in the form of a uh, nearest neighbor graph. And once you construct the graph, you create a low dimensional representation of the data. For example, in popular algorithms such as ISOMAP, this is done by using multi-dimensional scaling to preserve the geodesic distances on this graph. And once you get this low dimensional flattened representation of the data, you apply some machine learning algorithm that in many cases was simple clustering. So now with modern graph neural network pipelines, you can bring all these uh, steps into a single pipeline. So you can build the graph and perform machine learning on this graph in the same pipeline in an end-to-end -end way. So uh, maybe with some stretch, I, I could call this manifold learning uh, 2.0. So another question that is important, and I briefly mentioned it, uh, is uh, actually the theoretical understanding of graph neural networks. And one of the big questions is actually the expressive power. How uh, powerful are graph neural networks? So I mentioned already some results, the equivalence between message passing and graph isomorphism test, but these are actually very recent results from last year. So this is still an open question that is uh, uh, interesting and important. And last, uh, but obviously not least, the killer apps. So uh, when I started working uh, already more than five years ago on uh, deep learning on graphs, somehow I was hoping that in a matter of a couple of years, we'll see a breakthrough, a revolution, similar to what happened in computer vision with graph neural networks. And I cannot say that it really happened, uh, but I think that it might happen. And uh, we really see uh, graph neural networks being applied to a lot of different problems. And uh, really, graphs are very abstract and universal models for systems of relations and interactions that can be applied to modeling in uh, many different fields of science. You can see graph neural networks applied to recommender systems, to so particle physics. I had a work with, uh, you know, with uh, high energy physicists doing uh, neutrino detection in the ice cube observatory. Uh, we had a startup that was acquired by Twitter last year where we applied graph neural networks for problems of, of fake news detection. And there are many, many other examples. So there are really already first uh, success stories of, this, uh, of these methods. If you ask me what would be one field on which I uh, am willing to bet where these methods would probably make a breakthrough, I would say these are applications in medicine and biology. And you can really apply graphs there from all scales, from uh, nano to macro, from modeling molecules to modeling interactions between molecules and uh, basically interactions between patients, what I mentioned already with patient networks. And uh, some of the results are really extremely promising and I would say almost dramatic. So for molecules, modeling molecules and predicting their properties is really the uh, holy grail of uh, drug design and drug development. Because if we look at the space, uh, the search space, the, the, the space of possible synthesizable molecules, it is extremely large. We probably have uh, 
more synthesizable molecules than the number of atoms in the universe. I think the estimates are above 10 to the power 60. On the other hand, what we can test in, uh, in, uh, experimentally in the wet lab or even in the clinic is way, way smaller. We can probably test maybe a few hundreds or a few thousands of substances. So we somehow need to bridge the, this gap and this can be done computationally, what is called computational funnel. So basically you need to bridge this, uh, this gap and uh, you can do, of course, uh, uh, supercomputing simulations. Uh, uh, you can do some, uh, uh, some cheap and dirty approximations such as density functional theory that is uh, used in computational chemistry. Graph neural networks allow you to do uh, more or less the same accuracy, but significantly faster, orders of magnitude faster. And they're already interesting because uh, uh, there was a paper from a group at MIT earlier this year where graph neural networks were used in a pipeline that uh, allowed to discover a new class of antibiotics. It was published in Cell in February. I had a collaboration with uh, colleagues from EPFL uh, that are experts in protein design. So we de developed graph neural networks or genetic deep learning methods for designing proteins from scratch. And proteins are potentially interesting classes of drugs, biological drugs that, for example, can be used for cancer immunotherapy. So here we're designing proteins with certain functionality, such as binding to, to, to a cancer target. So that was also a paper that appeared on the cover of uh, Nature Methods uh, in February. Uh, taking, uh, uh, taking one step back, basically looking at a more abstract uh, uh, level of interactions between molecules, these can also be modeled as, drugs, as, as graphs. And here we can describe uh, uh, drug to target interactions as, uh, as graphs and the interactions between the targets, which usually are proteins, as, uh, as graphs. So uh, we can talk about problems such as drug repositioning or predicting uh, side effects of uh, multiple drugs or predicting synergies of multiple drugs uh, using graph neural networks. And uh, uh, just a few days ago, there was an announcement. Uh, I'm taking part of a collaboration with Mila in Canada and a pharmaceutical startup called Relation Therapeutic, where we are trying to use uh, these methods to develop uh, drug repositioning for COVID-19, which is obviously a very important and novel cause. I will finish with a uh, last example. Uh, basically talking about drug repositioning, we don't really need to look at drugs themselves. We can look at drug-like molecules and many such molecules are contained in food. So you might know that uh, foods, especially from the plant kingdom, are rich in molecules that come from the same classes as many oncological drugs. So we can use graph neural networks to predict this dry, drug lightness, and we can find what are the, the, the foods that are uh, most rich in these molecules, and then we can use them uh, maybe as, if not a therapy, maybe to prevent uh, 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 cancer and other diseases. And we have a collaboration with the molecular chef who is actually using these uh, discoveries, uh, the ingredients that uh, we are finding with uh, graph machine learning to design uh, very uh, appealing and very tasty dishes. So I guess at this yummy note, I would like to finish. And probably a good question here is, uh, let's uh, meet again in probably three years and see whether these promises have materialized. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael Bronstein, for your uh, for your talk here. Um, while I see if there is any questions coming into the chat, uh, if not, ladies and gentlemen, then send your questions to the chat, and uh, I will uh, pass them on to uh, to Michael. Uh, waiting for those first questions to come in, Michael. Um, what is keeping you awake at night, scientifically speaking, please? Um, if you look at your uh, at your research, well, your I, work, I uh, should say that I'm involved in multiple projects. So uh, for for graph uh, neural networks, uh, these are obviously problems that we are working on uh, at Twitter related to, to social sciences, things like platform health or uh, uh, detection of misinformation, especially in light of the coming uh, U.S. elections. Uh, biological problems, so COVID-19 is uh, really an important uh, thing, and I would say this will be really the, the call to arms and maybe the, 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 the test of how uh, uh, of the promises that, that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, 
uh, was maybe a little bit overhyped, whether it really can deliver. And I believe that, that if we are successful, that will be really, uh, really the case. And finally, uh, I'm involved in a completely crazy moonshot project, which is uh, using uh, machine learning uh, techniques that are developed for natural language processing to try to study and understand the communication of sperm whales. Wow, <laughs> that is cool. OK, um, there are some questions coming in. So I will start with uh, one of our reg regular uh, bringer of questions, Imdat. And he says, will it be beneficial, and if so, how much, if the initial features, number of triangles, for instance, of graphs are only approximated by sampling before input to a network, the complexity will be reduced from n hyphen k to s hyphen k brackets s is o brackets one close brackets. I hope I I make sense to you. <laughs> yeah, obviously it makes a lot of sense. So I think uh, this, this is an excellent question. So uh, I should say that the, the n, uh, n to the k is really the, the worst case complexity. So for many structures that, uh, that appear in important problems such as cliques or cycles, there are uh, better complexity algorithms. There are stochastic approximate algorithms with actually bounds on performance that uh, are significantly cheaper. So the, the pre-computation of structures uh, can be uh, much better. Talking about the, the subsampling, it is actually very interesting. So subsampling methods for graphs are used for uh, uh, mainly for uh, scalability purposes. And uh, one of the, the earliest scalable uh, graph architectures called SAGE, it's called sampling and aggregate, uh, 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 the acronym is SAGE, uh, uh, used, uh, uh, used sam graph sampling for scalability. But I believe, I have the feeling that it actually has to do with the, this bottleneck phenomenon that, that I mentioned, that graph sampling uh, allows to reduce or break the bottleneck. And as a result, it's not only, uh, imp it improves the, the scalability, but also improves the performance of graph neural networks. Okay, thank you. Um, before moving to, I think the last question for now, just a quick remark by Kingsley. He says, okay, three years, awesome presentation. So that one is in the pocket. Um, then I go to, to Neil, and he says, in 3D vision of the competing types of state-of-the-art approaches, which include CNN-based, point-based, and graph-based, what are the main advantages of graph-based methods over the others? Do you consider the dependency of having to pre-compute a mesh rather than operating on raw point clouds to be a limiting factor? Yeah, uh, good question. So for let's start from images, right? So if we are talking about two-dimensional images, uh, probably convolutional neural networks, because they are so efficient, uh, it is probably hard to compete with them. Unless you have a very good reason to use a graph, you can, of course, represent an image as a graph, maybe as a graph of super pixels. Uh, uh, you probably don't want to do it. Now, I should say that graphs are being used in computer vision as a, a side information, so at least in two ways. One is as a kind of a scene graph where you can uh, represent relations between, between things. So uh, 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 architectures such as capsule networks can be reinterpreted in the, uh, in the optics of, of graph neural networks. Second thing is uh, few shot learning because you can use graphs uh, to represent the structure of your data. So you are, basically you, you, apply, you would apply a normal convolutional neural network to your image but you will also be uh, uh, be exploiting the structure of the data space. We actually used uh, uh, this hybrid architecture of CNNs and graph neural networks to, for example, increase the robustness of, uh, of convolutional neural networks due to adversarial perturbations. Now, talking about uh, 3D data, meshes versus point clouds. So, of course, meshes are much nicer for uh, for uh, uh, for a geometer uh, because they, they, they keep the, the, the geometric Structures you can uh, basically you have the, the underlying the, the underlying uh, discretized uh, surface. Whether they are necessary, probably not. If your point cloud is uh, sufficiently dense and sufficiently nice, uh, it probably has all the information that uh, uh, that, that uh, is needed for the problem. Now uh, the graphs uh, are a kind of uh, intermediate way between meshes, where, which have a lot of uh, structure, and basically you, have, you can think of them as local uh, Euclidean representations of discrete manifolds versus graphs that are just uh, sets of points. 
uh, sorry, the, the, the point clouds, which are sets of points. So the graphs have uh, this local representation of structure, which is maybe a little bit coarse and primitive, but uh, uh, it is better than, than just point clouds. Okay, thank you. Um, um, meanwhile, the compliments keep coming in. Imdat says uh, a great presentation. Um, and there was one more question uh, before we go. Um, and I know it's hard for a sci scientist to uh, say yes to me asking you, can you come up with a short answer? But I would like to, uh, to try and have this one answered. The question by Hassan, it says, graph nodes can represent multiple information sources that have different features. Would having nodes in the graph that have different features influence the dynamic graph CNNs? I'm not sure that I completely understood the question, but of course you can you can represent. Uh, so uh, in in practice, these uh, the graphs that what we call graphs, uh, what I call graphs, are in fact uh, what is more correctly called multigraphs. So in multigraphs, you might have multiple edges between nodes. So th this is probably this is probably what what was asked in this question. So uh, for example, when you have two users and uh, on social network, they interact between each other multiple times. So you have multiple edges. So uh, because they also have timestamps, so they, they they are somehow spaced in time. So these are uh, in reality multigraphs. Yeah. So the the, uh, the short answer, uh, the the temporal graph neural network framework can address these settings. Thank you. Um, so we settle for the yes. Thanks. Um, okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to uh, another question in the fastest finger first competition before we say goodbye to uh, to Michael. And I would like you to answer your answer to this question as quickly as possible. And the question is, Michael showed us somewhere in his talk, a mesh of an animal. Can you remember which animal it was? Please answer the animal in the chat on the right side of your screen. The first one gets five points with the right answer. Number two gets four, number three gets three. Number four gets still two points, and number five gets one point. A mesh of what animal was part of the presentation of Michael? And I am waiting for the right answers to come in. And while I do that, I will tell you, Michael, that uh, another few compliments came in. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you, says someone. Uh, great talk, says Bat Erden. Thank you. Impressive talk, says Menwa. Thank you, great talk, says Yeni. So all compliments here. And now waiting for the right answer to the question. Yes, there are answers in. And I will scroll down and see who was number one. In that says a mouse. That was, uh, I'm sorry, that's not correct. Uh, in that, the first one I will count this as right was Ulrich, who says a bunny. I will count that as correct. So five points to Ulrich. Four points to Nigel, who says rabbit. Three points to Bernard, also rabbit. Two points to Yuk, rabbit. And the final point with also rabbit goes to Menwa. So those were the points for this round in the five fastest finger first competition. Ladies and gentlemen, um, can I have a great thank you? And I know you can't applaud him, so I will do it for you. Thank you so much for your talk. Michael Bronstein. Thank you.